Hello and welcome to 150 Days of Psalms. My name is Derek Hoven. I'm the pastor at Salem Lutheran Church in Orlando, Florida, uh, where each day I, uh, mostly from our space here, uh, reflect on one of the 150 Psalms. Today I'm actually sitting in a prayer room that we recently completed, and it sits on top of a bunch of prayers that were written on leaves uh, over a whole season of our life as a church together. And uh, the floor was laid over the top of those leaves. So uh, as I gather in this space to reflect on these ancient prayers of the church, uh, I sit atop the prayers of uh, this uh, congregation uh, that we gathered over uh, almost a whole church year. And uh, so today uh, we enter into Psalm 52 each day as I reflect on these. It's often through some of my own story. And uh, my hope is that you can find your own stories as well in these psalms and that they might speak into your life uh, in some uh, way that is uplifting for your faith. Uh, we read Psalm 52. You mighty, why do you boast of wickedness against the godly all day long? Continually you plot ruin. Your tongue is like a sharpened razor that commits deceit. You love evil more than good and lying more than speaking the truth. You love all words that devour, O oh, you deceitful tongue. O oh, that God would demolish you utterly, topple you and snatch you from your dwelling, and root you out to the land of the living. The righteous shall see and be awestruck, and they shall laugh at you, saying, This is the one who did not take God for a refuge but trusted in great wealth and found strength and destruction. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. I will thank you forever for what you have done. In the presence of the faithful, I will long for your name, for it is good. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I was on a project once when I was an IT consultant where we uh, had a bit of a problem with scope creep. Scope creep is what happens when uh, you've agreed to do a certain amount uh, of uh, work and uh, other work gets introduced. Uh, imagine if uh, you were building your own house and you had agreed with the builder to what kind of cabinets and floors and fixtures and paint and ceiling finishes and all of the rest of that stuff. And then you came to the builder and just said, you know what, can you put these cabinet handles on instead? Uh, and then that meant some more work. Or maybe you came and said, hey, you know what, after all, we would like to have a screened in uh, lanai in the back or back porch as opposed to what we were gonna do before. Now, if you did that with your home builder, they would tell you that uh, that's gonna cost you some more. Uh, but often in the a scope of a big uh, uh, information technology project, those little things happen and each one in and of itself isn't all that expensive, but over time, if enough of them uh, add up, it can be uh, quite a change in what was agreed to and the expense then quite a bit different. In the project that I was on, there were generally uh, somewhere between 60 and 120 of us all interacting with our client. And so there were times where when you add up all those little changes that we were agreeing to, it, it changed a lot. And so they, they had a big meeting of our whole project and the partner uh, came into town to to cheerlead and, and give us the big speech. And he looked at us all and said, scope creep is a problem and it has to stop. Well, that was good news for us because it's hard to manage a client's expectations sometimes. And we were working tons of hours to try to keep up with all of these changes. And he said, it's got to stop. So from now on, there's no um, changes that happen to what we agreed to without it being like signed off on and kind of run through a process of decision making. And he, he made this statement. He said, we are no longer going to over commit and over promise uh, to what we are capable of delivering uh, and what we have already agreed to. And for all of us, those were such welcome words that we weren't going to be anymore uh, committing to things that were uh, really uh, far out for us to reach and try to accomplish, many of which were impossible. And all of that uh, relief lasted about a minute because uh, after he said we are no longer go going to commit to things that we can't really do, he turned around and started to talk about a, a piece of the project that he said would be done in the next six months. 
Now, it just so happened that that was a piece of the project that my team was working on, and we had just finished estimating uh, how long we thought it was going to take to get that part of the project done, and our estimate was 18 to 24 months. So what we thought was going to take at least a year and a half, and that was a, a conservative uh, guess for us, he said we could do in six months. And it was uh, just deflating. Like we were so excited that the tone was going to change. Now all of a sudden there was this uh, unrealistic expectation that he had already promised to the client. Now I have little doubt that uh, this partner who's uh, general job it was, was to sell new work uh, and to manage client expectations. I have little doubt that uh, that sort of information is something that he would boast about to another client and say, well, look, on this other project, we were able to do this, and now we can do this for you. And that all of that was part of some sales pitch that put the spin on, the, on uh, what we were able to do and how quickly we could do things. But every time he did something like that and spoke those words, right, he wasn't the one who had to be there for extra hours. He wasn't the one whose time and energy it was devouring. And I, as I hear this psalm where it says, uh, you love evil more than good and lying more than speaking the truth, right? It, it might be a bit of a stretch to say that he was lying, right? But uh, the first verse says, why do you boast of wickedness against the godly all day long? And for me, hearing this psalm sounds a lot like the spin that we uh, dislike so much in our politics or the, the PR that comes out of corporations and the, the boasting that happens about the, the excellence of programs and products and all these things that are constantly being pushed and sold in our direction. And when you get to the fourth verse, it talks about you love all words that devour. And there is always some sort of devouring that happens when that spin is going on. Someone somewhere is having to work harder. Someone somewhere has time or energy or resources that are being consumed uh, because uh, those people in power are spinning their words and, and boasting of things and challenging and, and uh, doing all that they do to protect their places of power. And it's striking to me that a psalm that is so old can speak in such uh, poignant ways about uh, the present day, things we have like office politics and the promises that are made uh, that have impacts on the people that have to do the work. Now in all of this spinning and this line and this boasting that the psalmist has uh, issues with, uh, that the psalmist does not see that any well, but the psalmist never loses trust in God. Uh, in the, the last verse, it says, I will thank you forever for what you have done. We get lots of words from God in the Bible, uh, lots of things that are spoken in words we are to listen to, but the psalmist is not reflecting on God's words, but God's actions. It says, for what you have done. In the previous verse, uh, I trust in the steadfast love of God. There's something about this psalmist that has experienced faith, not just heard about it, not just learned about it, but experienced that presence of God in life. And it's that presence that the psalmist wants to give thanks for. And it's that presence also that allows the psalmist to speak truth to power, which I think is what is happening here. Talking about this boasting and these words that devour, these are, are, are accusations addressed to people with power who use their words and who use their boasting and who use their their uh, lying and misleading to hang on to power and to manipulate and take advantage of other people. Now, speaking truth to power is a hard thing to do, but the psalmist does not do it alone. After saying that uh, the psalmist trusts in God's steadfast love and thanking God, it says, in the presence of the faithful, I will long for your name, for it is good. So this psalmist is, is listening to what the powerful say and listening to that spin and that boasting and that misleading uh, seeking to find the actual truth, knowing that people are being eaten up by those that are powerful, and then is speaking that truth to them, but not speaking it alone, right? From within this faith community that is grounded in the steadfast love of God, so that that truth is spoken with love. Uh, it still has challenge and it still has bite, but it is uh, spoken with love from a place of understanding that God's love is what uh, makes us whole and well, and that it is a community of faith that uh, can ground us in that love as we go. Let us pray. God of truth, 
We too easily focus the energy of our faithfulness in the doctrines and beliefs of our minds. We draw lines between who believes what and defend the territory on our side of the line. Yet it is the experience of your presence in our lives that animates our faith. It is the experience of your grace that changes us. It is the experience of your love that we know as truth. Give us the wisdom to see this truth, the courage to speak it, and the humility to live within it. Amen. Thank you for joining me for 150 days of Psalms. Uh, Today that was uh, Psalm 52, and tomorrow we will continue with Psalm 53.